It's a Carson Price from Wall Center presentation, Applewood Auto Group. Jeff Patterson joins us now from Rinkwide, our Vancouver Canucks reporter. After the first Rinkwide post game of the season, a 10 0 loss to the Calgary Flames. Jeff, happy Monday to you. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. I was happy with Rinkwide. Uh, I don't think we need a do over on our first pot of the preseason, but uh, boy, the. Hockey club might uh, want to try it again, and, and, and they will. I guess that's the beauty of preseason is that <laughs> they will do it again on Wednesday. And I have to imagine that they're going to ice a much better and more competitive lineup uh, against the Oilers than they did a little further south in Alberta on Sunday night. Well, that was my first question to you, Jeff. You know, a new season upon us, and I, I think it probably bears um, bears mentioning that, um, you know, preseason lineups can be what they are. Did you see any kind of rhyme or reason to what Rick Tockett was doing with that lineup last night? No. Like, yeah, you know, was I surprised that the Canucks sent an inferior lineup, uh, you know, conventional wisdom in hockey, the home team, they've got ticket buying customers and they want to see the stars. And so, you know, the Flames didn't ice their entire NHL lineup, but uh, they had a lot of big names and big league players in their lineup. But, you know, in the same week that Jim Rutherford says, this could be a playoff team if everything goes right. And then on the first night of the preseason, they get stomped 10 nothing. I don't think that qualifies as everything going just right. So again, did the game matter in the standings? No, it didn't. But if it's all about putting the habits in place and trying to hit the ground running, I'm a little surprised that there wasn't an NHL line at the very least, and maybe uh, a couple more NHL caliber defensemen. There's the rules in place that you have to have veterans, and I, I imagine the Canucks figured out uh, a way to to satisfy the NHL's needs. Uh, but yeah, you know, this year six preseason games. So they had seven last year, including a couple of split squad games. Like, had this been a split squad night, I could have understood them sending that lineup to Calgary if they had a much better lineup playing at the same time at home. But uh, boy. You flush that one. They certainly did uh, on the ice. And I can't imagine that there's a ton of value in the video and, you know, going over game film from something like that. I mean, there were some instructive moments, I suppose, in terms of evaluating players that just aren't ready to compete against the National Hockey Leaguers. But, uh, yeah, a little surprised that they didn't send a, yeah. a stouter lineup for game number one. Well, particularly because of talking in the buzzwords, right? Structure, yeah. habits, system, standards, culture. <laughs> You know, none of that gets off to a swimming start when you're 10 buzz. Normally, too, I've noticed that teams generally try to do side do road and home games throughout the preseason to sort of allow them to have sort of game on, game off rosters. Starting on the road here, as they are for the first few, um, they're eventually going to have to send some brand name players out on the road, which they are generally loath to do when they go back and forth home and road. Yeah, it's a quirk. There's no doubt. First three are all on the road, and then the final three are home games, with the, one of the home games being played out in Abbotsford. But also, uh, now back to back, the next couple of games. So, you know, will some, I would imagine, there's certainly no rules that say a guy can't play back to back. And sometimes you want to test players, and, you know, that's part of the challenge. How do they respond? Uh, you can do it one night. And Rick talking talked about this at training camp, too. Like after day one, he was like, yeah, I was pretty happy with day one, but. It's just one day. Now they've got to do it again and again. And so I think that's part of the challenge in the preseason is to – remember, it was last year or the year before, Jack Rathbone played every preseason game, and they just wanted to keep testing him and not allow him to rest on his laurels. And so, uh, you know, there are different measures and different ways of evaluating through the preseason. But, yeah, it is a little strange to have three straight on the road to start, including back-to-backs in Edmonton and Seattle. So we'll see how different the lineups are against the Oilers and the Kraken. And then they're at home right up until that home opener on October the 11th. So lots of practice time, lots of opportunities. Once they get through these first three preseason games, they don't have to get back on the team flight, uh, you know, until they're out on the road for that five game road trip after the home opener against the Oilers. You guys were talking about how he was invisible last night. Vasily put Coles in features in our Bodog poll question. Jeff, are you worried about his development? I am. Absolutely. I am. And I don't know how anybody could look at it objectively and not have some concerns about a player that was a top 10 pick in the 2019 draft. I mean, we're now into 2023. Next draft will be five years since Pod Colson was selected at Rogers Arena. And I guess for me, the, the troubling part is nobody, including Pod Colson, really seems to know what he's supposed to be at this stage. 
like when he was drafted, there was talk about, you know, is there enough offensive upside? And maybe if people are expecting him to be a high scorer in the NHL, that's not going to be the case. But, you know, he's got this pro size and underrated playmaking skills. And, you know, we all kind of saw him developing into a penalty killing role at some point. Well, he hasn't done that at any level in the Vancouver Canuck organization, his brief time in the NHL. But uh, even when they sent him down to the minors, he wasn't a penalty killer there. And this is a team that had the worst penalty killing in the National Hockey League. And so, you know, I, I think there's some confusion on him, his part about what he's supposed to be. I think there are still questions within the organization about you know, where does he slot in? Is he a top six guy, a bottom six guy? Is he a physical force? Is he supposed to be a scorer? Again, why aren't they developing him as a penalty killer when last year, you know, anybody should have been given an opportunity to penalty kill the way that their PK was going. So, yeah, there's just a lot of confusion around him. And, you know, he, he seemed to be in a good mood at training camp, and they had placed him on that line with JT Miller and Brock Besser. Like, that's a, a confidence boost. It had to be. I would have thought that uh, he would have been able to carry some of that confidence over into the first preseason game. And while he didn't have JT Miller and Brock Besser in uniform, he was on a line with P.S. Suter and Jack Studnika, who were two of the more pedigreed members of the Vancouver Canucks in that lineup against the Flames, and he did nothing with it. Like, you know, forget winning puck battles. I need to see him getting into the puck battle, first of all. And this guy can't be a perimeter player. He can't come out of the night without, you know, any sort of bottom line. I mean, you know, he's not going to score every night, but, you know, put up three or four shots, look dangerous, have a, a scoring chance that we're all talking about today. Instead, it was like, where was Vasily Colson, who... You know, the way they were lined up on the depth chart, he was on the top line for the Vancouver Canucks. And there was, uh, well, he didn't look like a top line performer. And there certainly was no bottom line to his performance either. And nobody was great last night as a forward, obviously. But nope. at least, like, I did notice Niels Hoaglander on the screen a lot. And that, to me, that was merely the bar that I was sort of ready to evaluate Vasily Podkolzin within is, are, are, are you noticeable? And you got to give that to Hoaglander at the very least. Yeah, and just back on Paul Colson for a second here, and you look at his peer group from that 2019 draft. I mean, Trevor Zegras was selected ahead of him, so the Canucks didn't have an opportunity to select Zegras, who was the ninth overall pick, so two picks in front. And obviously, Zegras has joined an Anaheim team that's been down. He's been placed in a much better situation, but you know his numbers are off the charts compared to Vasily Paul Colson. But the guys that were still there when the Canucks selected, like Matthew Boldy, sort of profiles as the same kind of player, and he is developing into a star in Minnesota already. Two picks after Pud Colson, and of course, Cole Caulfield, uh, you know, one of the highest goal scorers already out of that draft class, and that was uh, the question on that that draft day. You know, if Caulfield's available, did the Canucks go that route? And obviously they didn't. They liked what they saw in sort of the raw tools in Vasily Pud Colson, but uh, yeah, just measuring him against his peer, like Hills Hoaglander, who was the second rounder that year, uh, his numbers skate circles around Pud Colson at the National Hockey League level to this stage in their career, and they're both relatively young, but you're right. Like, Hoaglander gets in on the forecheck and the big hit on Dennis Gilbert, and you hated to see him get injured. Uh, obviously, Gilbert got the better of Hoaglander in the first period, and that's when Matt Irwin stepped in. But, yeah, as I watched that game unfold, uh, I was drawn to Hoaglander. I mean, he was a guy that I was keeping an eye on after uh, his performance at training camp. And he's a guy that's going to have to be noticed every single time out if he wants to make this hockey club. But uh, just comparing those two guys based on last night's game in Calgary, uh, absolutely, I would say, a step forward for Ho Hoaglander. And unfortunately, and you're right, Blake, I mean, Pod Colson had lots of company, but uh, I would put Pod Colson in the step backwards category. And there can't be many more nights like that, or there's just not going to be a spot for him in the NHL lineup this season. Jeff, what's your two cents on Dakota Joshua's first weekend here? He gets into that tussle with Car Connor Garland in the uh, scrimmage in Victoria. He plays on a line last night with Atu Ratu and Sheldon Dries. And, of course, he ended last season pretty well, and we know he's got the stamp of approval from this management group. I think we're looking at a Dakota Joshua who sees himself as a top-nine guy, a third-liner going forward. A word or two on, on Joshua's weekend, please. Yeah, well, just a uh, clarification, and it was strange in the moment, but the, the tussle with Garland actually came in the special teams drills after the mm. scrimmage, which was bizarre. It just kind of materialized out of nowhere, but it was really over a puck battle, and Joshua seemed frustrated, and he kind of swung his stick a little bit. I think he thought he was uh, getting a piece of Garland, actually slashed Philip Hronik, and Hronik kind of looked around like, 
what did I do? Who got uh, me? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And then Connor Garland doesn't back down from anybody in a game or even in a practice situation. But yeah, I mean, there was a little heat to special teams that we just didn't expect. I do wonder, because I didn't think Dakota Joshua was particularly good last night either. And again, the long list. Uh, he got tangled up with Chris Tanev on one of his first shifts and and behind the Calgary net. And Tanev sort of fell on him. And I remember they had the camera shot of Joshua sort of limping to the bench. And I wondered if uh, he was hobbled in any way if that factored into his performance, because, uh, you know, as this game's getting away from the Vancouver Canucks, I'm thinking like, all right, who's going to, who in uniform tonight is going to sort of take this team and grab it by the scruff of the neck and try to step up and and show the flames that, you know, the Canucks were there to compete and that they're not going to get run out of the rink. And Dakota Joshua was the name that immediately sprung to mind. Now, Matt Irwin stepped up in the situation. He was on the ice. He was right there and he dropped the gloves with Gilbert after the hit on Hoaglander. I wasn't looking for Dakota Joshua to fight, but again, be the leader. Uh, The leadership group's not in uniform, so you are a guy that sort of established yourself as part of this team and a regular National Hockey Leaguer. By my count, Pia Suter and Dakota Joshua were probably the only two locks among the forward group on Sunday night that will be in the opening night lineup for the Vancouver Canucks. So I would have liked to have seen him read the room a little bit better and maybe just, you know, up his physical role in a hockey game like that one be aggressive, uh, finish your checks, all those types of things. He's such a big body. He can't be quiet. And yes, Rick Tockett sang his praises uh, down the stretch last year. I thought Joshua had a fairly quiet uh, training camp on a line with Nils Amon and and Linus Carlson, and obviously a little bit of chemistry with Nils Amon last year, but Linus Carlson is not going to be in the Vancouver Canucks lineup to start the season. So not exactly sure what the coaching staff was looking for there. And just in terms of top nine, Matt, you know, guys like Phil DiGiuseppe, Anthony Beauvillier. Beauvillier and DiGiuseppe were on a line with Teddy Bluger through training camp, and I think that that is a line that Rick Talk is going to want to get a look at. DiGiuseppe was one of the first guys out over the boards in the penalty-killing drills, along with Bluger. So read into that what you will. Uh, you know, there are a bunch of I was going to ask you about that, Jeff. Yep. Like, you, you actually think Beauvillier has sort of um, – you think he could sink the third line? Well, the the big wild card in all of this is Ilya Mikheyev, right? And, sure. And nobody has seen him. Apparently, he did skate uh, late in the day on Saturday uh, with that C group. And, you know, we'll see as the Canucks return home here and start now into more of their practices and when do they get down in numbers. But let, let's just, for the sake of this argument, assume that Ilya Mikheyev, I mean, he's going to be healthy at some point. You know, the question remains, like, where is he best slotted and where is the coaching staff? Like, Archdeep Baines on a line with Pia Suter and Connor Garland. Archdeep Baines had a nice young stars, didn't look out of place at main camp. I think he's going to get a look here, but let's not fool ourselves. But is he a placeholder for Ilya Mikheyev? Does Mikheyev drop that far down in the lineup? Or does Dakota Joshua perhaps slide in? Like, I could see a role for Dakota Joshua on a line with Pia Suter and, and Connor Garland. Uh, but then that makes you wonder about Beauvillier. Like, Teddy Luger looks to be the fourth line center. So anybody that's playing with him, he would think is on the fourth line. You know, I think that's a place that Phil DiGiuseppe can contribute to the hockey club. But this is a contract year for for Anthony Beauvillier. This is a guy that has scored 20 goals in the National Hockey League. It's a guy that found himself on a line with Elias Pedersen and Andre Kuzmenko after the trade last year. So that would be quite a drop on the depth chart for him. So I don't know if it's message sending from the coach. Whatever the case, I thought Beauvillier and Di Giuseppe did a pretty nice job in the scrimmage, getting into the four check, hounding Fox, and in fact, they turned one over, and Bluger scored his team's only goal on Saturday. So I do think that that trio is something to monitor, and I do think it's something that Rick Tockett probably wants to have a look at in one of these early yeah. preseason games. And, and I see a lot of people wanting to pencil in younger players, but I think Di Giuseppe is on this team and in this opening night lineup. Uh, I know you guys liked Hiroshi, uh, uh, if you could like anyone last night. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you about his uh, fellow college free agent from last year, Cole McWard. I think Cole McWard has put uh, a good foot forward here from Penticton on. Like, he was really good in uh, in Penticton. And again, guys with NHL experience, they should stand out, even if it's five games. I mean, he scored a goal against the Flames in one of his five games. He's got a, an NHL goal to his name. Uh, it's not about offense with him. We're still trying to get the full read on Cole McWard, but I, I just thought he, uh, you know, he, uh, my eyes were drawn to him in Penticton. So I thought that was a nice springboard into main camp. Uh, didn't look out of place. And again, two days of drills and then the scrimmage. It's hard to really 
uh, provide a, an accurate assessment of the guys that stood out as opposed to guys that fell behind. It was just a lot of teaching on the part of, of Rick Tocchet and his coaching staff. But again, Cole McWard, I thought, uh, showed well for himself. And then last night, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you can separate Hiroshi and McWard, and then there were the other four essentially on defense for the Vancouver Canucks. And it was a tough yeah. night for Jet Wu and Jack Rathbone, and Noah Juleson certainly didn't have his finest moment. And you know, matter when. I think he's a long shot to make the Vancouver Canucks, but certainly has uh, you know, veteran savvy and experience at the NHL level. Uh, but that left side third spot, I think, is still up in the air. Now McWard's a right shot guy, and so uh, we'll see how it all plays out for him. But if it was in the eyes of some, you know, a battle between Cole McWard and Jet Wu, uh, you know, even to hang around longer in this camp, then I think I would have to put uh, Cole McWard a, a step ahead of, of Jet Wu at this point. But yeah, I, you know, I, ha I just haven't seen enough of Cole McWard to fully grasp what he's going to be as he continues to develop. Like, are they looking for offense? He skates well and he's got pretty good size and range. And then it's a question of, uh, you know, how does he defend and how does he match up physically and those types of things. So I still think there's a pretty steep learning curve for him and a fair bit of room to grow. But the beauty there is, I mean, he turned pro after two years of university. So he's a little younger than uh, some of the other guys uh, like uh, Akito Hiroshi or uh, Max Sasson, who turned pro at the end of last season as well. Uh, Cole McWard has a little bit more time, I think, on his side in terms of uh, arriving at his full potential. Final yeah, one for 22 me. 22 for him, 23-24 yeah. for Sasson. And Interesting. Final one for me, because the young players never know when their last preseason game is going to be. So you kind of have to lay it all on the line. Guys like Ratu and Klimovich, um, you want to see just a flash. You want to see something to just be like, okay, that's what I can latch on to for the future. That's what the kind of player he is. Do you, do you see any such flashes from either of those two guys? I've kept a pretty close eye on Atu Ratu because, again, still in the information gathering mode here. And he's 20. He doesn't turn 21 until November. So he's young and obviously, uh, you know, wasn't any sort of throw in the Horvat deal. I mean, they were looking to get a future piece of this hockey club. And, you know, I, I thought he had a slow start in Penticton. They started him on the wing in Victoria, which I thought was interesting because uh, this team isn't exactly... Uh, you know, chock full of uh, legitimate centermen at the National Hockey League level. And so I, I would have thought that every rep he gets would be in the middle of the ice, but uh, they sort of swapped him and Sheldon Dries out. And then last night he was back in the middle and yeah, I thought he had his moments. And, you know, we talked on it on, on Rinkwide. Nine shot attempts just tells you that he had the puck on his stick in the offensive zone and was looking to shoot. He only hit the net three times and obviously didn't score, but I... I baby steps and relative to other guys that we wanted to make things happen, yeah, I mean, there were some moments Ratu tried to watch him closely at both ends of the ice, you know, far from perfect. There was one of the Calgary goals, one of the many Calgary goals to lose track. Um, but it was uh, in the second half of their goal scoring barrage uh, where he was a little slow to read and react and get to his man. And it probably was one of Coronado's goals. But uh, whatever the case, uh, you know, I think Ratu, he profiles as this guy that's going to be a 200 foot kind of player. And so you expect that there'll be some offense, but he also has to make sure that he holds his own in the defensive end of uh, the ice. And, and it was tough uh, for pretty much everybody in a Canuck uniform to do that against the lineup that the Flames drafted. But uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, coming out of last night, I would say Hoaglander was probably the best of the forward bunch. I thought Jack Stanika was noticeable, four shots on goal for him, and that continued a, a nice training camp. And so keep an eye on Stanuka. Not really sure where he fits in the grand plan, but he is a guy that's at least you know putting his best foot forward and trying right. to stand out. Mm -hmm. And as for Klimovich, like I just don't see it, unfortunately. And for a lot of the reasons we talked about uh, Pod Colson earlier, like just give me a moment, give me something. Uh, you know, he hit a post in Penticton, but over the course of three games at that level with the pro experience that he has, like he can't be clinging to Demila Klimovich hitting a post. You know, Aiden McDonough scored in all three of the games that he played at Young Stars. Like, that's what I wanted to see from a guy like Klimovich as well. And then on to main camp, a bit of an afterthought, uh, playing on an all-Abbotsford line. Like, I don't think that Danilo Klimovich is uh, in consideration for any sort of roster spot. Uh, I think uh, they've earmarked him already to start the season down at Abbotsford. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's a question of, you know, what kind of role does he have there? What does he do with the opportunity? We know that he's a he's got to be a scorer. And yet he's just been remarkably quiet through training camp, well, Young Stars training camp. And then uh, I thought, uh, you know, tough night for him. 
took the early penalty, kind of put himself behind the eight ball a little bit, but uh, just been waiting for any sort of flash from Danilo yep. Komovic. Kind of show us what you're capable of at some yeah. point. And, 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 and if like... you don't, others are going to surge in front of you, and that's kind of the story now for a guy like Jack Rathbone as well on defense is that, you know, he was the flavor of the month or week for a couple of years at camp, but as other guys have emerged and the organization's gone out and find other found other players, uh, you know, I, I, it just feeling more and more like Jack Rathbone is a little bit of an afterthought in this organization yeah, as well. well we were this close to our first do something of the year. From <laughs> I fought Jamie. the yeah. urge. I fought yeah. the urge. So yeah. just very quickly, do you think Klamovich gets another preseason game or is that that? There's only six this year, so which is why I ask. Right, and one off the board. So mm-hmm. my gut tells me that, uh, no, he probably <laughs> will be among the first right. that uh, yeah. is sent down to Abbotsford, and Abbotsford's going to start its training camp uh, next week. So uh, there will be some roster moves. Uh, maybe they keep this group together, as we said, with back-to-backs. That provides the coaching staff some options. But I would certainly think by uh, the time that game ends in Seattle that some decisions will have been made in either late Thursday or sometime on Friday. Uh, the Canucks will start to reduce their numbers. Marvelous stuff, Jeff. Thanks for this. We'll catch up later in the week. All right. Sounds good, guys. Thanks. This is a Carousel Price clip brought to you by Jason Dodd Mortgage.